So Pat mentioned Hold Fast. I'll just hold it up here. Um, it's a beautiful cover. It was um, a painting that a friend of mine in Indianola, Zan Jacob Brown, did. And um, the Hold Fast, of course, is the, the barnacle that holds the bull kelp to the seafloor. Most of you probably know that. And I was working on this collection. It's really been, it's the first collection I've done that hasn't had a theme to it, like navigation or extinct birds. So I was looking for some type of, um, some way to hold it together. And I sort of stumbled, I had written a poem called Hold Fast and was looking at the titles and thought, okay, that's it. And I was really pleased with the way it did, especially in these times, turns out to be an incredibly timely um, title as well. So it came out in February. And so I got, I squeezed in a few readings before the pandemic. Um, and many, a few like this were moved online. And I'm, again, I'm grateful to Zoom, even if I'd rather be in person. Um, so I'm gonna start with an epigraph from Kathleen Dean Moore, who's a wonderful, um, prose writer and philosopher who taught at OSU for many years. And this is the epigraph for the whole collection. Um, what will we cling to in the confusion of the tides? What structures of connection will hold us in place? And so I, I love finding epigraphs, especially when they happen to kind of bring things together for me. And so um, I'm going to try to read a few poems from each section to give you a little bit of a sample of, um, of the collection. So Wendell Berry, first epigraph in the first section. Now more than ever, you can be generous toward each day that comes young to disappear forever and yet remain unaging in the mind. I'm going to actually read, go off of my script, because I decided I want to read the very first poem in here called Bittersweet. Um, many of you read poems about fall, and I found myself gravitating toward those as I was choosing which to read. So I think I'm going to start with this one. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, and there was a plant that we called bittersweet. I don't know the Latin name of it. Maybe somebody knows it. Um, but it's described in the poem, and I just... Um, I think fall is a bittersweet time, especially this fall. Bittersweet, my mother called it, filling the back of the station wagon with tangled branches. The only way she knew to bring what's wild inside the tiny rooms of her colonial. How could I know it would trail me all these years with its bright eyes? Sweet bitter, Sappho called it, knew too well the heart's grammar, that the tang of cherries lingers longer than the sweet, that the ripe fig sweetens as its skin begins to pucker. It is just they are so intertwined. We can't greet one without the other, one's bright twin, one's lengthening shadow. So moving on, this in the first section, I, I sort of indulged my memories and went back and, and thought, um, just revisited scenes from my childhood, but again with sort of an adult lens. And um, I often get poems from NPR. On July 17th, 2014, it was the 68th anniversary of the bikini. Who knew? <laughs> so, so that was a great excuse to just, you know, go back into my memory banks a little bit. Growing up in the 60s, I knew the bikini as what my friends and I wore strapped to our flat chests. Nothing yet to hide, nothing between us and our copper toned tans. Oh, we slathered on the baby oil, glistening like slick linoleum in the hot Midwest sun. We didn't know it as a revolutionary act, wearing this skimpy suit so small it could pass through a wedding ring. The ad when it first came out, invented by Louis Riard to stir things up after the war. We just knew the song that played on the radio. She wore an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini and sang along, bamping it up. We didn't know that it was named after the atoll where the first bomb was tested, though I remember wondering, ah, the innocence of youth, 
why the atoll was named after a swimsuit. We didn't know that fallout from atomic testing slowly poisoned those on nearby islands, that strontium would honeycomb our bones as we've long since outgrown our bikinis, worry now about osteoporosis. In fact, can hardly recall wearing a bikini at all. The next one is also kind of a trip back in memory. Um, my family had a tradition of, play, of playing Monopoly on Sunday nights. And, and it was, um, we'd gather around the card table and then we'd fight over who got to be the Scotty or the Iron. Um, and so when I saw a little clipping in the newspaper that they were updating these tokens, it sort of broke my heart. And so I, I wrote a poem about it. And the poem kind of took a direct, direction of its own in the end. Monopoly. The boot booted, wheelbarrow wheeled out, thimble thumbed down, to be replaced by a T-Rex, a penguin, and a rubber ducky, says Parker Brothers, will not travel down tradition's track. One extinct species followed by the soon to be extinct too obsolete, replaced by one ubiquitous, but voted in and out by the people. What about that out of era top hat? Did it clutch its, didn't it clutch its cane, exit stage left decades back? Did we ditch decorum then? And when will we nix deep six the battleship? What to make of this trading in of tradition for what's trending this day, this hour, this millennium? How to pass along our brave old world? We leave the Scotty with the cat circling the board, buying up Park Place, Boardwalk, all the railroads, while we, distracted by our 24-hour news feeds, can't make a move. I'm going to see if I can slip in a poem for Sandy here because she really um, told me how much she likes my Titanic poem. So let's see if I can find it quickly in the book here. Okay. This is on the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic and it's for the bandmaster. We've seen the movies, sung the song, tried to imagine beyond Hollywood's rendition, the ship that would never go down. But it did. Stern sank first, bow thrust up like a skyscraper, lights winking in each stateroom until the generators, generators sizzled, slid into the sea. Meanwhile, the slow, confused rush for lifeboats Women and children, first class first, those in steerage left below to pray. Most accounts blame the captain. He was indecisive, muster weak, lifeboats launched half empty, radio man ignored warnings, radioed the wrong position. They say he went down with the ship, listening to the wind snatch notes of near my God to thee, Though even that story may be fantasy. In the end, it was the musicians who cared for the passengers, turning to their art to sustain them, though it didn't keep them afloat in the frigid waves of the North Atlantic, didn't bring them home to their families, ticker tape parades. 100 years later, we try to imagine not those lucky in the lifeboats, but those who stayed on deck stroking a violin, prelude to the cold sea, snapping shut like a purse, playing music that won't save anyone, each note hanging in the insubstantial air. So that's for you, Sandy. The next section is, um, has an epigraph from a poet I love Jane Hirschfield and a really quite old collection of hers now called The Lives of the Heart. Um, and the epigraph is, then the world is that actress from a Sanskrit poem whose greatness was showing two feelings at once. So I, I mentioned earlier, I sort of chose poems that were um, set in the fall and 
this goes back a long ways, back to my fishing years. I did gillnet for four years and, and um, one year after a really lean season, we wanted to go to Lake Chelan. And so we went there and then we picked apples to pay for our stay. And um, I gained a great appreciation for what hard work it is. And I also got a poem out of it. Um, and this is for my former husband, Dave. Late September, picking apples. Maples drift toward fall across the valley. Red veins creep, green leaves seep to yellow. Below, Lake Chelan draped in gauze on the hillside, apples wait on sturdy limbs. Back from a lean season, we pick apples to pay for our stay. I drag the wood, ladder, wood ladder to a gnarled trunk, set three legs in soft earth, apex vanishing into the cloud of galas. I square my shoulders, canvas bag loose like an apron across my chest cinch the drawstring tight, climb each flat run higher into the crispness of fall. I learn then to reach for one apple at a time, to twist its umbilical stem until it releases, ease each apple into the canvas sack, reach measuring the span of my domain, fall's fleeting circumference. I wobble down the ladder, to the wood bin pregnant with apples, empty the sack with a tug of knotted rope, quiet thuds. Back on the ladder, a new radius, reach, drop, palm round firmness of apple by heart until I can reach and drop like breath, inhaling apples, chill, fall, exhaling sun, salmon, summer, muscles tightening to hold the bag open, willing the heart to open, to whatever fall brings. Meanwhile, summer's last promise glistens like the lake below, all that eludes the apple, always just out of reach. The next one is kind of moving on to August. Um, and this is actually the title poem, Hold Fast. And the whole facet is, is described within this poem, so I won't, I won't describe it, but I think it's clear. Um, but it just seems like it's also a really good, um, valuable metaphor for these tumultuous times we're living in. Hold fast. The last week in August, too soon for falling leaves, fog that rises at dawn, ghosts up the beach, geese lining up in a ragtag V. Beyond the sandstone ledge carved like a torso by the waves, beyond purple sea stars inching toward tide pools, ribbons of bull kelp drift with the tide, ebb and flow, anchored to the seafloor by a half-inch barnacle called a holdfast. It knows the principle of hunkering down, waiting out the storm, staying put, all winter beneath the sea's relentless chop, it holds fast, gives over to each storm, flows with each rising tide. All winter, it lets go what it can, holds fast to the rest. So moving on to the fourth section, um, the epigraph is from a, a book by a wonderful memoir by a writer, Sally Mann, called Hold Still, a memoir with photographs. And the epigraph is, each of us leaves evidence on the earth that bears our form. So the poems in this section are about family. And I guess I should say, as we kind of go into this, Pat mentioned my um, collection, Beyond Forgetting. My, my mother died of Alzheimer's way back in 2001 quite a while ago now. Um, and I wrote poetry as a way to get through that really hard time. Um, so some of the poems from that time are in this section. And I chose this one because it's about making pies, which my mother used to make amazing pies. And it, I also associate it with summer because um, I just, I remember all those delicious peaches. What Daughters Do. 
Each July, peaches arrived in their purple carriages of tissue, fine jewels inside a wood slatted crate. One by one, we'd uncover them, each still warm from the sun, lay the soft fuzz against our cheek. Our job, slicing them for pies, what daughters do, while mom makes flour and Crisco for the crust. I never learned to make pie crust from her. When finally I ask, it's too late. She stares puzzled at the rolling pin, hands it back to me, says, here, honey, you do it. Today, I'm making pie crust, remembering all I saw. My hands roll out the crust in a full moon, drop thinner, more translucent with each stroke, fold it neatly into quarters, slip it onto the pie plate, unfold the quarters like wings, then crimp the crust, thumb nestling between fingers and arcs until the crust ripples, circling, more continuous than memory, claiming its hands. The next one is, um, it's about a, uh, it's about Thanksgiving. And I guess since Thanksgiving is coming up, it's another family poem. Um, and I think as we all think about just the challenges of getting along, I thought this one might be a good one to read. It's called Measurements. Was it the turkey cooked 15 minutes too long despite the thermometer thrust into its gullet? Or should we blame the mashed potatoes, russets stripped of the thin millimeter of earthy skin? Perhaps the stuffing boxed, laced with five grams of sodium? Maybe the gravy lumping without its quarter cup of roux? And so we gather here to give thanks for what we're no longer sure, the food before us, yes. But when did this dinner veer off course? When did we stop being grateful, want instead to be right? How to measure the moment love flees instead of stays? What are the rest of us to do now, but raise our glasses, lift our forks, eat and drink as if nothing happened, as if no one just slammed a door, drove off, empty plate luminous as the gibbous moon? As if we don't all know the ways we try to gauge love, all the ways we don't always measure up. It's really interesting to read that it's the first time I've read it, you know, during the pandemic. And I realize, you know, um, I'd give anything to be able to gather again at Thanksgiving. Um, arguments or no arguments. Oh. The next poem is a Sestina. And, um, a couple summers, a couple of three years ago now, my husband John's mother, Betty, passed away. And, and we went through all of the rituals that have, I think, become um, second nature to those of us who've lost our parents. And, you know, moving everything out of the house, dividing up things. Um, and in the process of doing this, I, I ended up deciding that I was going to give myself to help me focus, give myself the assignment of writing a sestina. So, um, so this is a sestina, and most of you know that that means that um, it's six lines in each stanza, and the last word on each line is repeated in throughout the poem in the other stanzas. So you'll hear six words repeated possibly, but hopefully not flagrantly. So this is called Taking Down the Paintings, and this is dedicated to my husband John's siblings, Sarah, Anne, and James. One by one, we take down the paintings, each with its backstory signed by the artist, its quiet middle finger to mortality, insistence that art endure, beauty matters, that we can dodge death for one more decade, maybe two with luck. But the decades wing past, kingfishers trapped in flight, painted on poverty, pottery, trivets, etched in stone, and death not yet on our minds. We wonder about the artists, 
Are they prosperous or starving? Will their legacy endure as long as this painting? We'd wondered when mortality would don a capital M, not a stylish beret. Now mortality strides into our lives, the word we'd avoided all these decades, letting our parents take their turn, endure the slings and arrows, we won't get painted into a corner. So we turn to art, let the artists do what artists do best, express the unexpressed, defy death in every hue. One painting's ghostly cross glorifies death, while orange poppies on a hillside shout, endure, and they will. Even unknown artists seize the day, paint their way to slippery immortality, one more disappearing decade before throwing down the trowel. Artists all to the end. But aren't we all artists recreating ourselves to endure? Please just give us a few decades more we bargain, block death at the door. And today we offer mortality a seat at the table, remove each painting with a sigh, release the artist to her easel, nod to death, promise to endure together whatever mortality has in store, and lean the paintings decade deep by the door. That one's a little bit of a challenge to read, but I, you may have figured out what the six words are, but it's a challenging form. And um, what I like about it, what I like about forms in general, and I have a, at least one student here, former student, and um, so Shika knows that I do assign forms when I was teaching, and I, I've been working with them a lot more recently myself. And then the last section, um, this is the section where my most recent poems are. So I'll read a few from this section and then I'm gonna end with a few poems, really recent poems, poems written during the pandemic. Um, so in this last section, I was inspired by a poet by the name of Joanna Klink. She's a Missoula poet um, and a friend had given me her, her collection and I was really moved by it. And it, it sort of responded to this in my own poems. Here's the epigraph. If there is a world, let me be in it. Let the fires arise and pass. Let the old hopes be made new. Let stacks of clouds blacken if they have to, but never let the people in this town go hungry. If there is a world where we feel very little, let it not be our world. I always get choked up reading that. Um, and that's from a poem called Processional. And the title of the book, if you wanna look it up, is Excerpts from a Secret Prophecy. And so here's my sort of response to that. And it's called Against Apocalypse. And this was actually, believe it or not, written um, several years ago too. And every time I read it, I'm reminded of how kind of timely it has become. No more crying over spilt milk, turned wine, over rain that won't fall, over calendar pages leafing the wind as decades blow past. The wind that once lifted each blade of grass, now taking down whole towns. Meanwhile, the earth spins on her axis. Day and night arrive on schedule, but seasons on strike. Certainties flown with the birds ocean lapping, hungry at the shore. Why do so few say it, the end of the world at hand? Still, we post photos of risotto, take selfies at the beach of our bodies buried in the sand, hunker down with YouTube, binge on Netflix, take up Zumba. Meanwhile, politicians lead us like lemmings for the cliffs, while the rest freeze in futures brights. The earth keeps spinning, sun rises and sets, civilizations come and go. We won't be the first, though we may be the last. But remember your neighbor who showed up with a pot of soup 
still steaming the day you lost power. Another who shoveled you out, drove you to the ferry in his battered four-wheel drive. Who knows what's ahead? Fast burn or slow freeze? Asteroids, black holes, exploding galaxies. If someday none of us can see the sun, remember this, the world you want to inhabit. Thank you. It's fun to see the little, the little hands clapping. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to read, this one is also, these are the kind of the more um, sobering, I guess we could say, poems. Um, so on that theme, I'm going to read one more, and then I'm going to read some um, pandemic-inspired poems, which actually have some humor in them. So you can look forward to that. Um, this one I wrote, it was the last poem I wrote in this collection, and I had attended a reading by Linda Beards, a wonderful poet that I have admired for decades. And in her new collection, she had a number of uh, form that I was, hadn't tried yet, and so I was inspired to try it. And the form is called a cento, C-E-N-T-O. And um, in it, you take lines from other poets and put them together in an order that makes sense. Um, but so your poem is made up of only of lines from other poets and it's, it's legal to do this. And it's also, I really enjoyed the process. It gave me kind of an excuse to go back through and read poets I hadn't read in years who'd inspired me early on. Um, and looking for lines that I liked and then kind of assembled them into a poem. And since there are a number of poets out there, I'm going to just read you the names of the poets. So you may hear them and see if you can pick them out as I'm reading. Um, these are in alphabetical order, not the order they appear. Elizabeth Bishop, T.S. Eliot, Jack Gilbert, Tess Gallagher, Robert Hedin, Tom Jay, Galway Cannell, Ted Couser, Theodore Retke, and Joan Swift. And there are many more poem, poets I love. So this is just who I kind of chose off, picked off my bookshelf on that particular morning. So this is called Each Bird Singing. And the title is also a nod to Tess Gallagher who has a, a poem titled Each Bird Walking that I've always loved. What seas, what shores, what gray rocks and what islands and scent of pine and wood thrush singing through the fog. So you see, to reach the past is easy, a snap, a snap of the sea and a third of a century passes. Good memory, if you are such a boat, tell me we did not falter in the vastness when we walked ashore. I am alone among the others who have stood here as they looked out over the snowy fields, holding their breath. What the train and the river were saying, no one could understand. We just stood there, breathing what was left of the night. The great light cage has broken up in the air, freeing, I think, about a million birds whose wild ascending shadows will not be back. Is light the last thing lost or never lost at all? All a scattering, a shining. There is time, still time, for one who can groan to sing, for one who can sing to be healed. We must risk delight, learn the flowers, go light, perhaps a speckled dream to wrestle in the night. Far out in a universe, a tomorrow we can't see is singing the last word of a song we heard long ago. Sparrow, your message is clear. It is not too late for my singing. With small hope from the center of darkness, she calls out again and again. Oh. Thank you. One of the pleasures of reading that poem is that I can sort of vicariously, um, you know, make a nod to each of those wonderful poets. 
So moving on now to a few couple poems written during the pandemic, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I'll read two. This one was written really early. Um, I found it really helpful to write, whether it turned into a poem or just a journal or a haiku or whatever that morning's sort of poetry practice was. Um, it's really helped me navigate these times. Um, and this one came out pretty quickly. This was March 15th, so really, really early on. And it was the day of the stay at home order. It's called Redefining Touch. We'll be in touch. We'll touch in next week. We'll be out of touch. We must redefine what it means to be in touch. Be in touch with those you love, not with the abstract world with its terrible news, but with its steadfast rocks, its tangled roots. Listen to the news until you can't. Then go out the door, touch all you still can, damp earth crumbling in your palm, tangled roots that burrow down into the dark, trusting what they'll find. Say no to crowds, to those you don't know, for now, stick with those you do. Reach out to the neighbor next door, even the one you quit talking to. Reach out to those alone, loved ones gone, Open your heart when you can no longer open your arms. Let in the pain of others because we must, but don't dwell there. Be the green tendril, the tangled root, reaching up, out, down, into the dark, trusting the deep knowing bound into xylem and cell that she will find air, water, sun, that all may not be the same, that all will be well. Okay, and then I'll, two more. Um, this is a slightly lighter one, and this was written three months into the pandemic. And um, those of us who I'm grateful, very grateful to have a wonderful partner to be going through the pandemic with, but you know, it's funny how you've been with somebody all these years, 20 some years now, and he still can surprise me. So um, this is in the third month of the pandemic, my husband goes through his sock drawer. I'm still in bed when he comes in, dumps his socks on the floor, begins to sort. Uh, what's your goal, I ask, to organize or reduce? Both, he says, methodically matching sock to sock, pairing the cuffs, rolling them in a neat bundle while I watch. I remember when we first met how this defined him, his quiet sense of order extending even to his drawers. My socks roam free through dark seas, each morning an adventure, a victory when I'd find a match. Hard now to recall that time we needed to argue whose way was right, an argument I never won, of course, except in my own discreet disorder. 20 plus years later, we've worked out our roles. I wash the clothes, separating lights from darks, dump the clean tangled wad onto the bed. That's when he comes in, listens to the ball game as he folds each t-shirt as shopkeepers do with practiced hands, helps each sock find its mate, rolls them into a ball and lines them up, soldiers at the ready. And 23 years later, I'm not sure what it means that I'm grateful for this, for our willingness to let each other be right, for all these small compromises that keep peace, for the mundane ways we restore order, for each ordinary moment doing each ordinary thing together while outside the world rages. So I'll just, I want to end on another poem. Um, this is an Alaskan poem, but before I do, I just want to thank you for being such an attentive audience and joining me in cyberspace until we can join again in person. Um, and thanks to Pat for putting in a plug for, for Hold Fast. You can order it directly from the publisher or support your local independent bookstore. And I'll end on, this is one of my favorite poems. Um, it's called Credo. And this was inspired by 
the years I've spent on the water in Alaska. Make a place for the glint in the seal's eye that second before she rolls back her slick head, slip silent beneath the surface. Make room for the shimmer of salmon, splitting the sun, leaping for the stream of his birth, even knowing what's ahead. Carve out a corner for the crab who grasped the blade of the cleaver that sliced him in two, wouldn't let go. That light, dazzling dark sea ahead, remember it. Remember how it seeps from billowing cumulus when you least expect, or how the sun finds the crack in the horizon's solder to empty out its cargo at dusk, a slick sheen across the water. How the green spinning earth and blue brimming sea go on and on, even when we're not looking. And that perhaps if we can pay attention for even a second, remember just this, it may not make us whole, but it could be a good place to begin. Thank you.